Dundee, Scotland. Lying on the northern shores of the Firth of Tay, it is home to two striking bridges. The historic Arctic vessel, RRS Discovery, comic book character Desperate Dan, and the UK's only charity working to better the lives of people with osteogenesis imperfecta, or OI, the Brittle Bone Society. 2018 celebrates their 50th anniversary, and we're going to take a look back at how one Dundee lady's actions transform lives and healthcare for over five decades. Margaret Grant was born with OI and experienced years of being sidelined by society despite being very bright. She was schooled with the involvement of the Girl Guides Association at Trefoil School and only received formal education from ages 13 to 16. However, she made the best of her life and work and later married her husband David and had Yvonne, passing on the OI gene. My name's Yvonne Margaret. Grant, it was because of me that the British Bone Society was born. We invited Yvonne to revisit the locations, both past and present, of where the Society has been located and asked her and others to share how the Society has changed and helped them. So welcome to one of the best viewpoints in Dundee. It's called the Law Hill. Let me tell you a bit about the history of the Bristol Bone Society. Over there is Cox's Jute Mill, and that was where my dad, 50 years ago, he was made redundant from. So it was very lean times. At the time, the government's family allowances were only paid for the second child onwards, so Margaret approached the NHS for help, but was told there was no help available. It was very closed if you had a disability, at that time you were shunned more often than not locked away somewhere if you had a disability you were different and didn't fit into society the health service was very young and there was no social services there was no one to help me margaret felt utter desolation the day she was told there was no help for her she decided if she wanted help she may as well start something that would help others and that's exactly what she did she submitted a letter to the Sunday Post, a national Scottish newspaper, hoping to find anyone else with the condition, or who could help start an organisation. My mum said, oh, here's a little letter, it's that size. And it was asking if there was anybody else out there who had brittle bones. And that was the first time that my mum and dad found out there's somebody else has this. Suddenly finding Margaret Grant and realising other people had it was a huge support for them and it was, for my parents, a lifeline. They had to write a letter to the Sunday Post, who then passed it on to Margaret. And from that piece of paper, 12 people came forward. And a few months later, in I think January 1968, four families met up in a house. The Brittle Bone Society was started here in 1968 at 63 Byron Crescent in the council house behind me. It had two small bedrooms, a lounge, a kitchen and a bathroom. The walls were damp, but it was home. The society from a very, very small acorn began to produce results. My mum absolutely says that, you know, the society itself and Margaret Grant changed her life. It en enabled her to be part of a community and understand the condition and understand how to be my mother and, and, and give me the support that I needed. And that was the first concrete information that my parents got about brittle bones. And um, really would never look back since. We know of roughly 2,500 people in Britain suffering from our condition. To help these people, it costs an awful lot of money. So if you'd like to send your ideas or donations to Mrs. Margaret Grant, Brittle Bone Society, one It was Topsy Turvey and I can always remember Mum having newsletters produced but not having the money to, to actually post them to the membership. One such letter from Margaret in October 1972 offered the following. 
We can't turn back now. When we started to write to each other, some of us thought that we were all alone. But people write to me from Aberdeen, Kirk Coddy, Belfast and Stoke-on-Trent. We can only achieve our aims by sticking together. This is only the start. The society soon outgrew the small space of Byron Crescent and a dedicated property was sought and one was found very close to home. Behind me is now a shop, a grocery store, but this was our very, very first office. It's 112 City Road, and in this building we had an office, a small storeroom, a changing area for a shop, and basically it was very, very crammed, cold, damp, but it was our first office and we were very, very proud of it. We bought it off a local baker, and we owned it for approximately 40 years. While the society was growing, so was the space it needed to operate. We were running out of space in our house. We needed somewhere for all the equipment to be stored. We were still operating from City Road, and we eventually ended up with a mortuary. Yes, a mortuary. And we're actually on what was the site of our mortuary. It had limbs and jars, it had examination tables. This was a building that was made out of concrete blocks, very cold, very unhospitable, but we were quite happy there. We were sitting in this long building with a storeroom and an office, and now it's a medical centre. It was a building that no one actually thought would serve our purpose. But it did. It helped us move forward. Around this time, few doctors were specialising in rare metabolic bone disease. And although there are four specialist centres in England today, for children with OI at the time, there was only the Wilson Centre in central London. And the BBS had a key role to play. So when I became a consultant and as a trainee, we were conducting the OI service at the Wilson Centre. It came about from the 1970s through mainly therapy services linking in with the Brittle Bone Society and from then the sort of OI service and the OI clinic was well, initiated. Meanwhile at City Road there was a need we realised to raise further funds for the society so we decided in our wisdom to turn it into a charity shop whilst moving to new larger premises for offices. It was first run by my late aunt, Mrs. Wilson. And then we got a shop manager called Teresa Canning, who ran it with many helpers. And Teresa retired and we decided that it was a good idea to sell the shop and move on to Pastures New. It was where the society truly became established. With its growing membership all across the country, the BBS realised that one of the best ways to help people was to meet together, to share information and to provide support. So, aside from the newsletters and without the conveniences of modern technology, the BBS began holding annual family conferences. Well, annual conferences has been what's held us together, basically. We actually hired about two or three lorries at a time, and we packed up all the equipment that we needed. We would travel the length and breadth of Britain. Welcome to Scotland. Thank you. Thank you. And your keys yeah. are over there, and you be good children, or you're not getting back. We were shipped in by buses, rickety old buses that didn't have seat belts. That was the 80s, um, and they were held in universities. I remember it was hard beds and student accommodation. Yeah, we're now in very posh surroundings to what it started. It was the first time I'd met another child that had OI like me, and that was the biggest thing. The first conference that we came to after my son had been diagnosed was, for me, like a revelation. Before that, we were incredibly isolated. We went to our first conference, it was just Ron and myself who went and he was just so happy being around other kids, not being the different one. Um, it was kind of amazing really because everyone was on the same peg as you. Um, people just saw me as me. Obviously coming to the Brittle Bone Society and meeting other parents and children and, and just learning so much. 
gave us the confidence to carry on. I suppose the support from each other from going to the meetings, that was the only time that they'd see each other. We came last year and we were totally blown, overwhelmed by the whole experience, about the amount of people that he met, the information that we got. So then we set up our own group back in Belfast. You talk over the internet to these people and you never actually meet them face to face until you come to one of the conferences. But the other side of it is it's just such good fun. We're kind of inseparable really. And all the medical knowledge that we all now know is, is so much better. We moved heaven and earth so that these families could be together for three days, sometimes four days. We'd pack up again and we'll say, we'll see you next year, we'll see you at a local branch meeting. I think it's been a wonderful, happy weekend. And all the members hope that they'll come next year to our annual general meeting and reclaim their badges. Up to 30 years age, you know, the parents have Parents of children with OI, Ireland, Facebook groups and stuff like that, they can be in contact all the time. You know, that support network is fundamental for every part of your life. So the Little Bone Society, when I came and met with everyone, it was kind of like my second family and nowhere else did you ever feel that you were kind of with people that were just like you. As we were leaving, I kind of got really emotional and I was like, I didn't realise how stressed I was until I wasn't stressed. Even when you go home, you know, if you're having a down day, which everybody does, it's nice to know that, you know, you were at a conference only a couple of months ago and there was other people like you and they're all right now. With the continuing growth of the BBS, the society expanded its offices from the shop and moved them to the northern edge of Dundee in 1986. Welcome to our office at Dunsinane Industrial Estate. If you can imagine, there was a great big wooden ramp. Our main door was there and our entry point for our goods was that iron door there. It was massive. It was where the highway programme was recorded with Grampian Television. Yeah, there was many a, a famous guy or, or authoress came into that building to help promote the society. Harry Seacombe, and there was many a member came to visit as well. And we had fun, we had laughter, we had tears, and it was just a wonderful piece of history. That was Dunsinane Avenue. Following Margaret Grant's example of filling in the knowledge gap, helping people with OI, and campaigning for disability rights, the Brittle Bone Society has always worked hard to inform members educate medical professionals and petition governments. You know, babies are born um, in hospitals that are a little bit more remote and therefore the, 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 the knowledge just isn't there. I was the only person growing up that they knew of in Kerry, so that's the county that I'm from, that had brittle bones. A surgeon had taken down an encyclopedia and showed them a paragraph, this is what your child has. The hospital that I was born at really didn't know what care to give me and were probably breaking more bones than they were healing. And it's only really through the Brittle Bone Society that people find out about the specialist centres and the specialists that are out there and, and get the support that they need. You get to speak to professionals that you wouldn't ever meet. In an environment like this, they feel more comfortable to interact with you and be able to ask questions that maybe they feel inhibited in a, in a hospital environment. I'm lucky enough by coming to the Brittle Bones Society and attending the conferences and the meetings, I've I met with some doctors from Sheffield. After meeting Nick Bishop at a Brittle Bone conference, my parents decided to transfer my care up to Sheffield Children's Hospital and that was a game changer for me. But I think it's more of the emotional support and the information and just having someone there at the end of the phone. Just having other people to talk to who understand. It has been amazing. Just invaluable. You can't you just can't put it into words. Two years after it became law that all children with disabilities would be educated, the popular Magpie Show ran a TV appeal for people with brittle bones, raising over one million pounds. Welcome to the Magpie Brittle Bones Rally. Mobility, or to be precise, the lack of it, is the greatest single problem facing young children suffering from brittle bones. 
Your money has made it possible for every single child in Britain known to be suffering from brittle bones to receive the special kind of vehicle that he or she needs. And believe you me, it's money well spent. There was the magpie appeal. I was very fortunate that I was given a sewing machine and a typewriter. And that really was so useful for me because I then went on to be a touch typist, like Barclays, and also sewing. I've always had to alter all my clothes. The appeal funds went beyond providing chairs and equipment for people's homes. It meant the society could invest in helping families in other ways. People were having to cancel their holidays due to fractures. We had the Magpie appeal and we were able to purchase two caravans for families to come and tour around Scotland, visit our offices, have some fun and get the kids down to the beach where they could maybe have their first chance of playing in the sand and going for a paddle in the sea. And we were very fortunate to have one here on Riverview Caravan site, which was sited at the far corner over there, which was gifted by the Dundee Licensed Trade Association. And about six or eight families had the pleasure of coming and having a week or a fortnight's holiday. We also had another holiday caravan bought from the Magpie Appeal on the Isle of Wight called Robin's Nest. This was dedicated in memory of a young baby who died of the condition. Either the holidays were sponsored or they paid a small sum. It brought many happy times to all the families. At around this time, families were celebrating the new child benefit bill, meaning a mother could now receive benefits for each child. And medical care was slowly improving too. So there has been a, a shift in how we care for people with these conditions. So people are now thinking much more about not just about uh, children, but how these children will live in adult life. Over the last 15 years in Glasgow as well as Scotland, a lot of the children with uh, complex bone conditions such as Ossigens and Perfecta were not managed uh, within the children's services, but they were managed by my colleagues in adult metabolic bone services. More of these children are being managed now uh, by paediatricians with a specialist interest in the field of bone. You've got an integration of the healthcare professionals with the society to the extent that you guys aren't afraid to ask us anything at all and expect a reasonable answer in a dialogue. We've moved away from paternalism, if you like, and it's much more now a team effort with the patient and the parents, the carers being part of the team. Working with hospitals wasn't something new to the BBS, especially when in 1991 they moved into what was then Ward 8 Strathmartin Hospital. This was another one of our offices. Originally it was going spare via NHS Dayside. I can remember it as being late 1970s, early 80s. We were jigging between 112 City Road and we were jigging between the mortuary. There was great turmoil looking for places to hold our offices come storeroom. It was just chaotic and people were just guiding us to various places. Basically, there was about 12 different sections in the ward. Mum had an office, the secretaries had offices, I had an office. There was a meeting room, there was a kitchen where families could come and just chill out together. And there was even a snooker table that the kids could play in the corridor because it was so big. And there was a many a good fundraising meeting taking place in that hospital unit. So that was our experience with Ward 8 Strathmartin Hospital. We eventually had a building appeal that led us to our current offices and it was launched by Buy a Brick and from there great things happened. The Society's current premises is on Guthrie Street in the centre of Dundee, which opened in 1996 and was named Grant Patterson House, named after two influential families in the Society's history. Eventually, having collected so much information and memorabilia over its history, the Society decided in 2011 to donate these items to the nearby University of Dundee, for them to be fully preserved and archived for the future. Although the Society has always been headquartered in Dundee, the Society has continued to champion and support the causes of OIers across the United Kingdom and Ireland, causes for which Margaret Grant herself always fought. 
such as disabled rights, equal opportunities, equal access, and the need to research to find a cure. Thus, the need for the BBS is just as relevant today, both for long-standing members and families just coming to grasp with the diagnosis. So obviously as parents, you're just standing there with your mouth open. They told us she was going to die, basically. We carried her around for the first six months, can you believe it sounds crazy now, on a pillow, because no one could tell us actually how to handle her. We thought we were never even going to be able to hug her because she was going to be too fragile. We were incredibly isolated, really didn't know anyone. It was a terrible time, it was really, really awful. We contacted the BBS and immediately felt valued, felt comforted, felt supported. They have helped in school, sending information out to the teachers. And I can't speak highly enough of the way that they treat new parents and help them through very, very difficult times. Depending on where you live in the country, it is a bit of a lottery what you can have access to. You go to a wheelchair service, you've got a choice of three chairs. It doesn't matter what your needs are, you've got to have one of those three chairs. That's why you need to come to the Brigglebone Society. For me to be able to live and go to work, I needed a wheelchair that can elevate. We would not be able to have afforded the wheelchairs that she needs on her own. And just from getting a new chair, I'm, I've had so many more opportunities because I'm able to get out and about and do what I need to do now. This is actually the first NHS wheelchair I've actually qualified to get in my whole life. So up until this point, from when I started mainstream school, I've always had my power chairs, but funded, at least part funded, by the Brittle Bone Society, which is obviously life-changing, because without a power chair, I wouldn't have been able to go to school, study, work, parent, travel, all the things that I've done, experienced in my life, I couldn't have done. I've also seen uh, children with the, the age they have, have changed over time so that they're much more uh, able to move around, do things independently. And some of that, no doubt, has been with the help of the Brittle Bone Society. I finally have bought my own place last year and the Brittle Bone Society has been vital in getting that equipment to me and getting the right equipment. As much as I'm thankful for the stuff that's related to our disability and to my condition and stuff like that, it's the stuff outside of that. Myself and Kasharan, another member, we went to India together last year. There is no way if I didn't know her and if it wasn't for the BBS that I would now have had that life experience. Margaret would no doubt be delighted to know the BBS is empowering people to live richer lives compared to 50 years ago, filling a need where one is seen. Similar age people got together and said we need something for the teenagers and for people in their 20s. The Voice is a weekend uh, opportunity for young people to get together and share their experiences of um, kind of growing up with OI, learning to live independently, um, learning to live without parental support, university or moving away from home and things like that. Seeing other people do things in the future that I wanted to do, and they inspired me. The right activity with the right advice for the right people is an incredibly positive thing to have in your life. understanding of how we can help people who have OI has uh, improved dramatically. People born with OI these days are so different to uh, how it was when I was born. But we've still got an awful long way to go. We want people to tell us what are the things that they want research done on. You know, what are the things that would make the most difference to them in their lives? Um, you know, it, and it may be little things. You know, we've achieved quite a bit in children and now it's extending into the adult community and that's the reverse to what normally happens. Normally services develop in the adult community and then trickle down into children. We have driven this from, from, from the children up effectively and I'm proud of that actually. Um, I think that's been something that's been worth doing. Uh, it's made a big difference to the lives of a lot of children and their families and I hope in the future it will also make a difference in the lives of adults with OI too. Generally, I find having a disability is a lot more accepted now, and you are seen as a person. Ah, we've got a fantastic guest panelist today. Please welcome Sam Rang. 
loved my father. He was my biggest cheerleader. He was so petrified when I was a baby because I was, you know, I've got brittle bones and he wouldn't even give me a hug or, or anything like that. But he was the one that told the doctors, you know, he's going to achieve and I don't care what you say. And, uh, and here I am today. Whoa. People's attitudes have changed massively because now they see disabled people working, going to university, and they've only been able to do that because they've had support from the charity, they've had the right equipment to do it, they've had driving lessons. So we've dispelled that myth that you're on benefits forever when you've got a disability, you're not. You get a job and you take part in everything. You can be whatever you want to be. I was a Paralympic swimmer, now a Paralympic sports commentator. I've been linked with the Brittle Bone Society for a long time, okay? And I've seen over the number of years I've been working with them that you know, the organisation itself has changed. It's become much more professional as to how it, it works, how it generates funding, how it fundraises, um, and you know, how it uses those funds. And I think that it's a reflection of this society um, maturing over those 50 years. It's completely transformed over time. The BBS assisted OIFI when it started 25 years ago, and it collaborated with the OIF in America these organisations still offer each other mutual support today. In 2016, the Society became members of the Association of Medical Research Charities, were recently accepted into the Society for Endocrinology, and in 2017 launched their first ever research grants programme. All of these are a tremendous milestone and have taken extra time and effort in order to get this rare condition truly recognised. This is a testament to the BBS and its ongoing professional journey, which ultimately raises the profile of OI as well as those who live with it. One of the biggest achievements for me was getting the medical board established where the creme de la creme of the medical people were able to get in a room and discuss research ideas and treatments and then share it with the rest of the OI community. I just can't quite put into words just how much the Brittle Bone Society means and how much the Brittle Bone Society has done for me personally. I think the biggest thing I'm proud of is bringing in a team of people at HQ who work so well together. They're dedicated, they're professional and they really care about OI people. I feel like the Brittle Bone Society has been such an important part of my life. I suppose I'm very thankful for the stuff that the BBS um, has brought to me. OI care in England has really has really progressed along that time. We honestly, me, my mum and my dad, all say the Brittle Bone Society saved my life. I would not have lived beyond five years old. So what has changed 50 years on since Margaret was told there was no help for her daughter? Well, as a result of her letter to the Sunday Post, lives have been saved, prospects improved, schools have been adapted, specialists have been trained, laws reformed, rights extended, research advanced, and awareness raised. But crucially, people affected by OI are no longer without help. Although many of these good changes have come from other sources in society, the Brittle Bone Society has always been, and continues to be, a force for good in the lives of many. Basically, we've got links stretching across the world, all because of a little house in Dundee that started the society in 1968. Like all societies, they started through the hard work of various people. And I know your uh, originally started with uh, Mrs. Margaret Grant and her family. And I do think you ought to give them a tribute. Mum, when she was crocheting all the things to, to get the society started and having sales of works and things like that, just hoped that it would go on from year to year. We never envisioned that it would last 25, nor 30, nor 40, and then we got to 50. I hope that people recognise the impact that basically one lady has had on lots of people's lives. So, you know, that Margaret Grant and, not, you know, and the people around her um, started this small support group that has become this big place where people can go for help and I think that um, that's amazing and um, I know that we all appreciate that and if I left today I know that the, that the charity is in a good place. 
Yeah, well done, BPS. <laughs> yeah. If I had a glass of champagne in my hand, I would say thank you very much. Here's to what's been before us. Here's to the future. May the God of hope bring you wisdom, joy, love and peace. And may we never have to endure the pain of broken bones. Here's to the next 50. <laughs>